The largest sleep experiment of all time, spanning about 1.65 billion people across 70 different countries, happens twice a year. It's called Daylight Savings Time. A study conducted in 2020 looked at the data and found some shocking results. On the day following the shift to daylight savings time in the fall, the study observed a 24% relative increase in heart attacks, a 6% increase in fatal car crashes, and a statistically significant increase in suicides. Another study found that judges dole out harsher sentences on the day after daylight savings, all over a one hour shift in our sleep routines. To say that sleep is important would be an understatement. That's why I embarked on a research journey to discover what a science-based sleep routine would look like. The sleep recommendation that most of us have probably heard is get about eight hours of sleep per night. And according to health organizations globally, most recommend between seven and nine hours per night. But sleep science has come a long ways in the last 10 to 15 years, and people in the scientific community are saying that quantity is not the only important metric when measuring a great night of sleep. More and more people in the scientific community are getting behind this concept called QQRT. This stands for quality, quantity, regularity, and timing. Quantity. Like I said, most health organizations globally recommend between seven and nine hours of sleep per night. And up until about a decade ago, this is all the information we had. Quantity has been a good predictor of things like blood sugar regulation, immune health, and even mortality risk, but it left a lot of things to be explained. This is something the scientific community calls variance and some of these other metrics that we're about to talk about help eliminate some of that variance. The next element of QQRT is quality. Quality is broken up into two different categories. First is continuity. Continuity is basically saying where you sleep continuously or did you wake up frequently. This is often measured by something called sleep efficiency. If I was in bed for eight hours and I was awake for two of them, my sleep efficiency would be 75%. Generally, a sleep efficiency of 85% or more is considered healthy. The second element of quality is electrical power. Now, unfortunately, this is not something that our consumer sleep trackers can measure. Basically, this idea is when we are in deep sleep, this measures the magnitude of the brain waves during that time. Generally, the larger the brain waves, the better the quality of the deep sleep. Now, it's very important to know that you can't shortchange quantity or quality of sleep. Both are very, very important. The third element of QQRT is regularity. Basically, this is the idea of going to bed at the same time and waking up at the same time. This is a relatively new area of research, but early studies are finding that this may be the most important element. The UK Biobank released a sleep regularity study within about the last year or so. They found that those in the top 25% most regular with their sleep, compared to those who were more irregular with their sleep, had a 49% reduced risk of mortality relative to someone who was very irregular, a 35% decrease in cancer mortality, and a 60% de-risking of cardiovascular mortality. In this study, regularity and irregularity carried almost twice as much magnitude of predictability than quantity or quality. The final element of QQRT is timing. This is also known as chronotypes. Your chronotype kicks in once you're an adult with a stable sleep routine in place. Chronotypes splits people into five different categories based on their natural wake-up times. There are plenty of tests for this online that only take a few minutes. If you just Google chronotype MEQ tests, you should be able to find them. If not, I will leave one or two linked down in the description. Now, why is this important? Well, chronotypes determine your natural circadian rhythm, when your body is meant to be awake and meant to be asleep. And the crazy thing to me is that you have absolutely no control over your chronotype. This is something that is biologically built 
into you from the time you were born. Now, when you combine all four of these elements, that is when you have the best chance of having the scientifically best night of sleep. When your quantity of sleep is in the correct range, when you're getting great quality of sleep, when you're going to bed and waking up around the same time, and when you're going to bed and waking up in a time range that naturally aligns with your circadian rhythm. Now, there are a few tips I'm gonna throw in here that are all aimed towards nailing your QQRT. Now, I already said this, but go to bed at the same time, like within a 30 minute window, doesn't matter what day of the week it is, this will help nail down your regularity of sleep. Two, darkness in the evening. Darkness is really important for this. Darkness actually releases melatonin. In the last hour before you go to bed, consider dimming down the lights in the house at least 50% and make them a very warm temperature. One study showed that 15 seconds of bright light exposure after that start of melatonin can totally disrupt that flow of melatonin and delay our sleep. Number three, temperature. Science generally points to an average ambient temperature of about 67 degrees being the optimal range for sleep to occur. Now that doesn't mean you shouldn't cover up with blankets or whatever you want, but the ambient temperature of the room you're sleeping in should be around 67 degrees Fahrenheit. Number four, if you can't sleep, get out of bed. This one was really helpful for me. I'd never considered this before. I just assumed, well, once I'm in bed, I need to stay in bed until I'm asleep. But basically, if we do this over and over and we're having a hard time sleeping, our brain can start to associate bed with wakefulness. And so basically, if you can't sleep for maybe half an hour or so, consider getting up, going out, maybe sitting on the couch with some dark, warm light on, reading or something, right? Don't scroll, don't check email, and don't eat because those will all kind of signal your brain, hey, this is a wakeful activity, whether it's the light or starting that digestive system. And then only when you're actually sleepy, then go back to bed. Number five, be mindful of alcohol and caffeine. A lot of people don't like this, but it is just what the science says, and so I'm just gonna relay that information. With caffeine, the recommendation is to cut yourself off about 10 hours before bedtime. Ideally, you would limit yourself to no more than three cups of coffee, but that varies for everyone. So it turns out that alcohol is actually not a sleep aid. It's in a class of drug called a sedative. So instead of sleeping, you're really just sedated. This will often really hurt the quality of your sleep. And so you will often wake up throughout the night, but they will be small wake ups. So wake ups you won't remember, which really hurts your sleep efficiency and makes your total quality of sleep suffer. The other thing that alcohol does is it is a REM sleep blocker and I will get to why that is important in a minute. This one has been very helpful for me. It set a bedtime alarm. I usually set an alarm about an hour before I intend to be in bed. I'm always surprised how quickly this sneaks up on me. The alarm will go off and I'll be able to turn my attention towards winding down for bed. Now, when I was talking about alcohol, I talked a little bit about a REM sleep. So basically, I wanna break this down. There are two main types of sleep. There is non-REM sleep, and REM sleep, and both are equally important. Generally, non-REM sleep is associated with healing and restoring the physical body. REM sleep is all about learning and memory and emotional regulation. Now, as we go through the night, we go through four different phases of sleep. Depending on your sleep tracker, this might break this down some different ways. For example, on my Apple Watch, they break it down into awake, core sleep, deep sleep, and then REM sleep. Core sleep combines two of those layers. They're just kind of the general lighter levels of sleep. If you look at deep sleep, deep sleep happens mostly in the first half of the night. That is non-REM deep sleep. And so that is basically when your body is restoring itself and preparing itself for the next day. And then as you continue your night of sleep, later in the night, you start to have more and more REM sleep. So if you're robbing yourself of enough sleep, you're actually cutting off a lot of that REM sleep. I don't know about you, but I've definitely had some periods of my life where I have not been sleeping well, and my whole life has been affected, but especially my memory. I have 
like very little recollection of what actually happened during that time. And I used to think kind of jokingly, like was this a trauma response to this time? But it was probably that I wasn't getting enough REM sleep and so my brain wasn't actually able to process through and store all of that information back in my long-term memory. At this point in my life, I'm getting the most sleep per night I ever have in my adult life. But the more diving in I've done, I've realized how important sleep actually is. In fact, it's so important that I don't think there is a single system in the body that isn't affected by sleep deprivation. If you're interested in diving in deeper, I've left a few resources that were really helpful to me down in the description. I want to leave you with a quote from Dr. Matthew Walker. Dr. Walker is the founder of the Center of Human Sleep Science at UC Berkeley and the author of Why We Sleep. It is an entirely selfish act to prioritize my sleep. The greatest health insurance policy that I know of that is universally available, largely free, and mostly painless is this thing called a night of sleep. So I'll gift it to myself every single night.